Hello, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nick Measures. I'm an editor here at INSEAD and I will be helping moderate today's session. Uh, today's session is going to be exploring the topic of innovation and specifically the importance of businesses of integrating continuous innovations into their organizations. Our three speakers today are ideally placed to help us explore the practical steps and the challenges that need to be addressed when building such formal innovation structures. First up, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Ben M. Bensal, whose new book, Built to Innovate, Essential Practices to Wire Innovation into Your Company's DNA, is really the launch pad for today's seminar. Ben is a Professor of Technology Management and Professor of Asian Business and Comparative Management at INSEAD. He served as INSEAD's Dean of Executive Education between 2018 and 2020, and was previously a visiting professor at Harvard Business School, a senior scholar at Wharton, and a visiting scholar at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley. Ben's research focuses on how to create innovating capabilities and competences as a way to build an innovating organization and culture, blue ocean strategy and value innovation implementation, new forms of organizations, how to build social capital within firms, and the impact of information technology on innovation. Ben has been consulting for Asian, European, and US corporations since 1993, including working with the organizations represented by our two other speakers today. Cenk Alper is the CEO of the Turkish industrial conglomerate Sabanchi Holding. He holds a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Middle East Technical University, as well as an MBA from Sabanchi University. Cenk joined the Sabanchi Group in 1996 at Bexa later taking on managing positions in Belgium and the US at Beckup. In 2000, he returned to Turkey as the Global Technology Director at Quarter and completed the establishment of its R&D Center and Innovation Division. After serving as COO, he led Quarter's transformation and secondary public offering as CEO between 2013 and 2017. He has been the CEO and a board member of Sabanchi Holding since August 2019. Cenk is also a former a member of the Turkish Industrialist and Businessmen's Association, the World Economic Forum, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the International Corporate Governance Network, the CNBC ESG Council, and the Wall Street Journal CEO Council. Finally, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Monica Lessel. Monica is the Executive Director of the Bayer Foundation and Head of Corporate R&D and Social Innovation at Bayer AG. Monica holds a PhD in biochemistry from the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics in Berlin, a diploma in general management from Asheridge Business School London, and is a former fellow of the Robert Bosch Foundation. She is a member of Bayer's Global R&D Executive Committee and the Global Medical and Regulatory Governance Committee. Her focus is on driving organizational and societal transformation by strengthening the role of science and promoting innovation and sustainability through strategic initiatives governance processes and partnerships. She is a board member of the Futurium, Berlin's Museum of the Future, and acts as a jury member of the European Innovation Council and the German Ministry of Science and Education. So you've heard me talk for enough, so uh, now I'd like to get the session started properly. Um, I'd like to start things off with you, Ben, and uh, ask if you could please tell us a little bit more about the findings of your book. Specifically, I'm wondering if you can share some of the key processes and structures you identified as necessary to constantly drive an organization's innovation engine. Over to you, Ben. Thank, thank you, Nick. Uh, if you allow me, I would like to uh, first thank again, Jenk and Monica, uh, first for their tremendous support during the, uh, the research and the writing of the book. And I'm very uh, happy and excited that they agreed to join us for this webinar. Bayer and Sabanji Group companies are very good examples of uh, how to systematically develop what I call an innovating engine and leverage the innovating capabilities of everyone in the organization. Um, but before we get into the uh, conversation, uh, I would like to just say a few words about uh, what the book is about and set up the context. Many people uh, equate innovation with a new product or uh, a life-changing uh, new business model. Many also think that innovation uh, needs, for the innovation you need a genius leader or to be a startup to innovate. Not true. 
During the research, I found uh, many established, even centuries old companies able to innovate. How? They don't focus on industry changing effects, but on small, important uh, changes and very often in unexpected places. To do this, they rely on continuous and systematic innovation. Innovation of all kinds and driven by everyone in the organization. For this, they um, create what I call an innovating engine, uh, a protected space, a fully legitimized space where everyone can innovate, not only uh, your genius leaders or the R&D specialists. You can innovate in everything you do, not only in your products and services, but also in your processes and internal functions. And innovating is a habit not just the sporadic burst of creativity when in times of crisis. So Built to Innovate, uh, the book is really about how to embed continuous innovation within your organization. For this, you need to create uh, an innovating engine. Um, and uh, it, just like uh, every organization, innovative organization is now driven by two twin engines, an innovating, uh, an execution engine, uh, dedicated at uh, efficiently implementing today's strategy and an innovating engine dedicated to thinking and creating the uh, future of the organization and the strategy. And just like uh, the execution engine has a, a formal organization, the innovating uh, uh, engine also has a formal organization. And what I'm saying is that every employee uh, has a contribution to make to both engines. Both engines are running simultaneously. In other words, everyone in the company has to spend some time in the innovating space, being involved in some form of innovating activity. So as I said, just like the uh, execution engine has a formal organization with uh, a structure, underlying processes and its own culture, the innovating engine also has a formal uh, structure. Clear roles and responsibilities is driven by clear processes, formal processes. Uh, I refer to them as creation, integration, and reframing. And it has its own unique culture uh, with uh, shared norms of behaviors, shared values, and rules of engagement. So let me just say a few words about these three processes. Creation is a process by which organizations generate new ideas. New ideas that create value for a customer, internal or external. These ideas, these new ideas, represent the essential raw material for innovation. And naturally, frontline employees and managers have a key contribution to make to, uh, to the creation process. Integration is the process by which these new ideas get connected to each other, get connected to other people in the organization and to resources in the organization so as to create a collective innovating capability for the organization. The integration process is also the process by which New ideas get winnowed, channels selected, some get tested, some the best ones get prototyped and end up finally being moved to the execution engine. I discovered that middle managers have a pivotal role to play in the integration process. Finally, the reframing process is a process by which the organization questions uh, its strategy while it is implementing it. It is the way by which it challenges assumptions, key assumptions about the industry, about the company, its mission, its vision, its strategy, uh, its own identity, its own definition of what it is and who are its customers. Naturally, senior leaders have an essential role to play to contribute to the uh, reframing process. Maybe this is a good time to maybe invite Monica and, and Jeng to tell us a little bit about how do these three processes come to life 
at Bayer and within Sabanji companies, tell us a little bit about their own experience, some of their challenges and maybe the, 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 the evolutions forward. Yeah, um, hi Ben. Monica, yeah, that would be great if you could just, uh, you've heard obviously Ben's talking summary of the book and the framework needed for innovation. It would be really interesting to find out how that corresponds with uh, your, you know, your own experience of building the governance structure for innovation at Bayer. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Nick. And uh, hi Ben and everyone here on this webinar. Uh, great being with you. Thanks a lot for the kind invitation. It's really an honor to be here and it has been also a real pleasure on working with you on that uh, exciting book. So I thought maybe I, I take a step back. And uh, so I, you heard I'm a biologist, biochemist and um, built to innovate is for me something which is kind of essential to survive. Yeah, It's essential for human beings. If we don't innovate, which is called evolution, then we will not survive. And I think the same is true for organizations. So if you don't transform continuously, we will not survive and in the end get disrupted. So this is why this is so close to my heart. And especially today when we all had to solve these huge challenges, it's kind of about a constant evolution and constant transformation. Uh, so I thought maybe I give you a bit uh, insights on how this all developed and what was the reason why we kind of set up this kind of innovation engine, how, how Ben is calling it. Yeah. Um, so in 2014, um, the board decided to appoint a new board member responsible for innovation. And the reason was exactly this, that kind of transformation is ongoing. The digital revolution uh, was on the side. And so they really wanted to strengthen innovation. And uh, so he then asked me whether I would like to join him in that journey. And I think the first question he really asked me, can you live with a white sheet of paper? Because there was really more or less nothing we would start with. And I said, yes, I mean, this is something I really like. Um, being a scientist, you, you like to create and to shape things. And then we started, of course, um, in looking, what do we want to achieve? And it became very clear that we want to go beyond R&D. So I'm coming from the R&D field and classically, Innovation has been defined as R&D, but it became very clear it's not enough. And I think as Ben mentioned, it is important to involve anyone in the innovation process. So we also started to talk to people and what they told us is, well, yes, I would like to join the process, but I don't know how, where can I find information? In which direction should I drive innovation? So these were all questions that needed to be addressed. So we need to provide tools, and of course, strategic direction, what was very, very important. Yeah. And then the other part was that they didn't feel included because classically innovation has been defined as R&D, as I mentioned. So we need also a new definition for innovation. And the definition we created was innovation is something new that creates value for the customer and for society. And I think that was really I would say a breakthrough, it sounds little, but uh, I mean, being here made more inclusive to all our employees made a big difference. But then of course the question is, how, how do you get there? How can everyone in that company get involved? So what we did also is, um, so a while ago we started a platform which was called Vsolve. And at that platform, challenges could be posed posted and everyone in the company could read it and find answers or solutions. So this could be uh, technical challenges. I just it's, uh, looked it up today and one challenge there is, for example, uh, the development of uh, new algorithms to uh, better predict the harvest. So Bayer is a company, so we have three main businesses. One is pharmaceutical company, is pharmaceuticals, crop science, and also consumer health. So. Um, so the challenge, for example, today um, I found was, um, okay, is, are there better algorithms or can someone help with algorithms to better predict harvest? Uh, so in order to optimize uh, product supply and the supply chain. So this sounds like a very specific question, but you can imagine how many data scientists are across whole our company 
who can then help and maybe find some interesting solutions. So this was a platform that was at its infancy, but we found it is very useful and it was one of our first building blocks to expand this, made it accessible across the company. And we also expanded it not only to technical questions to the one I just mentioned, but also to questions related to, for example, um, we are, had built up a new performance management system and we wanted to hear what are the expectations of our employees and what are the proposals. So we made a, a post and a challenge and there, it was a super lively debate on that platform and people felt much more involved than it would usually had happened. So these are just some examples. So that was one building block. But then of course, people wanted to know, okay, how can I innovate? What methods are available? And the question was then, of course, how can we bring these methods to the people? And we then built kind of also, in addition to that challenge platform, a platform where you could find some information, methodologies on innovation technologies, for example, systematic inventive thinking and other methodologies. But of course, just reading them or training is not enough. And what we then started, and we got also inspired by John Cotter's um, uh, uh, article also, where he also described this dual engine, what, what Ben mentioned, yeah, that you on one hand have, let's say, the hierarchical structure of an organization, which in a company with 100,000 people is absolutely important. But you also need an agile organization. And this agile organization is a network. It's kind of a network of people that work together across divisions, across functions, along specific projects and challenges. And this is what we started to build, an innovation network. And But we not only build a network, we made this in a quite systematic manner. Um, so we defined different roles. So one of them is an innovation coach. So innovation coaches get some training on met, uh, innovation methodologies, and they are kind of spread across the whole organization. So we have now, I think, trained about 1,000 people across the organization to become innovation coaches very locally. Um, and then also, but in order to orchestrate that whole network, we also needed people with a more senior role, let's say in the middle management, which we call innovation ambassador, which in the end then helped to orchestrate that network. But of course, it also needed strategic input. And therefore we built an innovation committee with senior executives at Bayer, who then kind of helped to steer and define that whole endeavor. And my team, of course, was responsible to implement it, to build it, to develop the strategy, and then also to, to further grow and develop. So I think with this, maybe I stop here. Um, and of course, we had many more activities, initiatives uh, in order to make that work. Um, but maybe I stop here at the moment and hand back to you and we can discuss this later. Yeah. Thanks, Monica. Yeah, I'm sure we'll come back to that. And I, and I see we're already getting questions in the chat. We will get to those later, if, even if they're not covered now. But, but now I'd love to, to hand over to Cenk. And uh, obviously, like Monica, you were also brought into to your company, into Corsa, specifically to create an innovative environment. So I wonder if you could just cover some of the, the key strategies that you introduced and, and maybe just cover a little bit about the outcome and, and how it helped to transform the, the organization. Thank you, Jen. Oh, you're on mute, I'm afraid, Jen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nick, thank you very much. Uh, ben, congratulations again for the book. I am uh, once more reading it, uh, and uh, every page, <laughs> you know, inspires me again. Thank you very much. I think it's a great contribution to business environment. Uh, and uh, it's a great honor for us to be in the book with Kortsa, my previous job, uh, and with Savanji Holding. Uh, it's, the, it's a complement structure where Kortsa is one of the subsidiaries of the whole group. Uh, so I would like to start with the reframing process uh, and the challenges we had. Uh, and then I'll go to innovating engine part of it. Uh, 
so in when we met with Ben in 2007, uh, Corsa <laughs> has faced a challenge. We we had a partnership with Dupont, and we were getting all the research and development product development from Dupont Center in US. But once we bought their shares. Uh, you know, uh, we were alone <laughs> for innovating. And all the uh, major tire manufacturers like Michelin, Bridgestone, Goodyear, Prelli, uh, they, are, they were classifying their suppliers uh, as commodity suppliers or strategic partners. And without having an R&D center and innovating capabilities, we were forced to become a commodity supplier, which we didn't like. Uh, so that's why I have been invited to the company, Corsa, uh, to restart the R&D and innovating engine over there so that we can become a strategic partner. So uh, uh, this is a very nice reframing opportunity, actually. Either you sell a standard product to a standard uh, customer or you become a lifelong partner, co-innovation partner with a customer. Uh, and then you reframe your uh, actually strategy. This was the first step. And we have started with the Blue Ocean. And uh, thanks to all my friends in the company who created new products, new business models, etc. We have switched from a blood red ocean <laughs> to blue oceans. Today, uh, I am proud to say that uh, within 10, 15 years, uh, we have almost 1,000 patents. And we have industry uh, changing uh, innovations over there. One, for example, to give you an example, uh, sustainability is key. And there was a, a chemical uh, invented 100 years back, resourceful and formaldehyde latex, which is environmentally not friendly. Uh, but all the industry is so used to it that nobody wanted to change. So with the core generation, core uh, creation with a customer, we have developed a water-based coating and uh, our customer has approved it, a, a German supply a customer. But what we have seen that uh, actually at the end, uh, we have to change the industry standards. So we have publicly opened the tire and reinforcement material patents to all industry players. And now we are changing the whole industry uh, from an environmental unfriendly solution to an environmental friendly solution, which was previously invented 100 years ago. So this shows if you focus, if you have a real challenge, then you can change the, uh, the industry dynamics even. From that, actually, we have developed many competencies in the company. Uh, as Corsa became number one supplier worldwide in nylon fabrics and number two in polyesters, but the growth and the market size was not enough for us. We have been challenged that how can we grow further? Uh, and that was the second step of reframing from a tire reinforcement material suppliers we became a reinforcer. We call it uh, the new purpose of the company is inspired from life, we reinforce life. So if you have the reinforcer, reinforcement knowledge, and tire is the most complex material to reinforce actually, you can reinforce everything. So from there, we shifted to construction reinforcement. We shifted to composites aircraft industry. Now our reinforcement materials goes to Mars with NASA, <laughs> with NASA equipment. Uh, we shifted to uh, flexible electronics. So it was a very nice reframing that by utilizing the reinforcement knowledge, which is actually strengthening and uh, you know sticking it to somebody, uh, something else, we have reframed the whole playing ground of Corsa. Uh, that was uh, uh, exactly what we have done. Now at Sabancı Holding, we are running to a reforming process. It was a holding with silos in banking, in insurance, in energy, in industrials, etc. 
But once right now we reframe it is we are not a holding company holding 13 different companies, but we are an ecosystem and we are an ecosystem player. Within that ecosystem, in the boundaries, with the cooperation of different com uh, companies, we can create new innovations across industries and we can uh, increase uh, the wallet of share at our customers from multiple sectors. And now we are coming up uh, many ideas. How you can do that? Of course, the reframing is one, but settling down the innovating engine, injecting the innovating engine to the company is extremely important. Uh, so we have to give freedom to frontline operators at the plants and frontline people at the sales and marketing so that they bring challenges, they bring customer needs to the company, to the companies, so that, you know, we have a need to solve, we have a challenge to solve. Once you have identified that challenge, once you have identified that need correctly, the blue ocean methodology that we have utilized, and there are alternative methodologies, presents us many alternative paths to come up with innovative ideas. Once you have those ideas, you have to streamline these ideas to industrialization with certain filters, with certain uh, uh, actually execution engines at different steps like prototyping, concept formation, industrialization. Then you come up with extremely new ideas. So for us, uh, identifying a need by getting closer to customers and then trying to find solutions within the organization with an innovating engine is the key to success. Let me stop here. Thanks, Jing, for that. Um, that's great. So I think I think uh, I think maybe we can bring Monica on screen now as well, and maybe just open it up a little bit more. Um, and I think actually we've got some questions coming in, which I think uh, it's probably a good time to to try and. Uh, to try and address these now, as I think they build on the conversations that we've already had. Um, I think one question that's clearly coming through at the moment is um, a lot of people are asking, uh, you know, obviously they understand the importance of innovation, but um, they, they, the kind of, are there the key strategies that you uh, implement um, in, in an organization? And how do you get the balance right between innovation and execution with your em employees? So I don't know, Ben, maybe you can, we can start with you on that and then uh, we can open up to, to everybody else. Yeah, I, I can start with, with kind of a, a, a way to frame the, the conversation and then, and, then, and then maybe we can go to the explicit example uh, uh, at, at Bayer and Savanji. Uh, uh, what, is, what is important to understand is that the, uh, in, an innovative organization is functioning with the two engines uh, running simultaneously which means that uh, every employee has to spend some time in both engines. Uh, and this, this, this is really where the middle managers uh, play a critical role by creating some, 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 some first, first most important thing is to give permission to people to innovate. If you don't give permission to innovate, they won't be able to get involved. Then to create uh, a, a space where everybody on a regular basis is involved in some innovating activity. And it can be as simple as representing one's department or one's function as part of a cross-functional uh, innovation uh, team. Uh, it can be as simple as uh, uh, everyone uh, on a regular basis spending maybe 30 minutes if need be uh, with, with, with uh, a customer. Everybody in the organization has a customer, whether it's an internal or an external customer. So I think it's very important to give permission uh, to the frontline people to innovate. And if you need to, to put some sort of a incentive, it should be on middle management uh, to create uh, uh, an incentive system where the innovating capability of the middle manager is, is, is what is rewarded and not as soon as you start to put pressure on the frontline to deliver on innovation, you are killing anyway, innovation. The most important thing is to give permission, give support, give, like Monica and Jenk were saying, give people challenges. But if you start to, to, to expect them to deliver on that, 
you 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 might uh, you might kill it actually. And I and I come back. I can come back and explain why I think so. Okay, thank you, Ben. I mean, again, I guess that that potentially is a challenge that that does seem to have come up in the conversation as well. Uh, and, and maybe we can go to you, Monica. I mean, what were some of the challenges in terms of getting people within Bayer on board and, and, and involved in the process and eager to do in the process? And, and one of the questions that's come up already is, is it a question of uh, making it, uh, you know, incentivizing it? Is it a que question of putting it into their KPIs? Or, or does that, like Ben says, mm -hmm. Does that run the risk of, of you know, um, stifling innovation or, or putting people off? So again, maybe some examples of, of how you've confronted that challenge. Right, right. I know. I think it's a it is a challenge. Uh, I mean, to be honest, um, I mean, one way uh, we kind of were working on this, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, we had this we have these innovation coaches, and they dedicate about five or ten percent of their time uh, towards kind of these innovation activities and engaging others into. We call that innovation sessions or fast sessions, which can be quite short, two hours or so, where you bring where they bring kind of different type of people together and then work on a on a specific challenge that is locally relevant. Yeah. And this can be a process or or, or whatever is 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 of relevance there. Um, but what we also did is kind of talking to their managers, yeah, because it's important, as as Ben mentioned, that they have kind of that safety net that it's it's allowed. And we call it also psychological safety because may, some of these things may fail. So you have to be sure that what you are doing, you are allowed to do. And I think that's also a leadership question. And the more you advance, uh, of course, and senior management and executives, is, it's key that you can deal with that because if you can't, your kind of company will, will no longer exist in the future. Yeah. Um, so I think it's important to, to give on one hand that freedom, but also to define in which areas do you, should you innovate, because what are the guardrails? Uh, otherwise, you can have thousands of flowers, flowers bloom, but you don't get a strategic direction. Um, so I think it's really um, an art, but uh, it's worthwhile and it's, it's important to, to go there. And what we also did on the long run, we really included that innovation thinking in all our leadership courses, because that's critical. To make it sustainable, um, you have to include it in our goals. So it's now uh, included in our, we have the so-called life goals and inno innovation is kind of a key element of it. So everybody has to embrace it. We have included in all leadership trainings, in onboarding trainings and so on and so forth. So that it's coming constantly uh, to the employees. And I think that's also so very important um, to have that in a, in a, in a long-term and sustainable way. Thank you, Monica. So, yeah, I mean, over to you, Cenk, as well. I mean, again, Monica was talking about training there, and uh, I know that was a big part of, uh, of, the, of the movement uh, to get innovation started at, at uh, Corsa. And I, and I know that you're actually still actively involved in uh, training even at Sabanchi. So, I mean, again, could you maybe just cover some of the, some of the training and, and what it was really hoping you were hoping to achieve by, by carrying out that training with, with specific members of the, of the organization? Okay, uh, let me mention uh, with, uh, by starting with, with a higher purpose. So almost four or five years ago, we were visiting Silicon Valley and we were meeting with many entrepreneurs, startups over there. And whenever you talk with them, they were talking about a higher purpose. Uh, they were trying to find a global solution over there. So I think this purpose thing is extremely critical to motivate, incentivize people so that people find a meaning into their job, meaning into their function, a meaning into their day-to-day -day operating. Uh, and the reinforcer concept at Corsa uh, we now people at the uh, at Corsa calls themselves we are the reinforcers of the uh, world. So this gives a huge uh, actually motivation to everybody. Of course, you have to support this with alternative uh, incentive mechanisms by positively discriminating innovative ideas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Training is extremely critical because if you don't set up a simple, me simple methodologies to come up with, first of all, challenges, needs, and then solutions into that, an idea created in a room fails somewhere in the whole innovating process. To do that, uh, after trained by Ben as an innovating coach, 
I have trained by myself at that time as CTO, uh, more than 500 people uh, spending days into those innovation and showing that commitment from the top and telling people that everybody can innovate in the organization uh, creates a huge momentum, created a huge momentum. That was for the white colors, mid-level managers. The second program that we have started is total productive maintenance, actually is an operational excellence concept generated by Japanese. But with that, we have democratized innovation at the plant. So we have given the ownership to every single blue color operating their machines to improve their equipment, to improve their product, to improve their processes. So then we made them part of the executing engine integrated to innovation engine. Because in the innovating engine, NRD can come to an initial product level, uh, but then this has to be improved within production continuously. So you always improve the standards quality of that product or standard efficiency of the product. In that respect, the TPM system that we have introduced into the executing engine and Blue Ocean Strategy engine, innovating engine, operates together so that we can come up with new processes, new products, new uh, business models. Thank you, Cheng. If, 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 if I may, if I may, Nick, uh, just want to kind of reinforce what uh, what what both are saying here, and and this is something that was quite uh, uh, unexpected for me in the research is to discover how middle managers are very critical to 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 make innovation happen. As a matter of fact, as you can see, senior leaders. Uh, they face a very unpredictable and fast-changing environment. For them, innovation is 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 a no-brainer. Uh, frontline people are facing customers and non-customers on a daily basis, and they understand the pressure of of of, of responding and and innovating. But the ones who are kind of uh, caught in the middle, shielded from this direct pressure from the environment are middle managers, because on top of it, they are incentivized on execution. They are the ones who have to deliver on execution. So I think in both cases, what I'm hearing is that uh, a lot of effort was spent on uh, explaining, maybe training first middle managers uh, 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 so that they can they can motivate their people to innovate. And then of course, for people to innovate, they need three things. They need to feel that they are able, which is basically that they need that they have the permission from middle management and from senior level people. They need to have support, which both Monica and Jen mentioned about providing resources, providing training, providing time, and then they need to be motivated. And that's exactly what both were saying about creating a sense of a mission, a challenge, enlarging the challenge, giving people autonomy. So the key issue here is that when people are operating in the innovating engine, this is a totally protected space. This is uh, some, where the, the norms of engagement, the rules of engagement, the norms of behavior are very different when, than when people are in the execution space. So that would allow the frontline people to speak up to uh, to challenge the assumptions, to bring ideas. Otherwise, what I noticed in the research is very often frontline people, uh, in spite of all the words they hear, you know, we want you to innovate. They they're afraid. Uh, the word innovation very often uh, uh, creates a sense of stress and 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 fear in people. And and I think if they don't feel that uh, the top and middle managers are sincerely giving them permission to innovate, it's very difficult for them to, to, to do that. Okay, I mean, that, that's, that, that's interesting. And I think that answers one of the questions here, which is, you know, how do you, how do you, make, uh, how do you make people feel safe to innovate? And I think you, you have addressed that in certain points. I think um, one thing is obviously now you have innovation engines up and running and you've got those in place. It's, do you feel that there's something that you need to do? You, do you think this is a continual process? Do you have to keep uh, developing new strategies? Um, and, and I'd be interested to know what has maybe changed at, at both Bayer and uh, Savanchi since, since the book was written. Um, 
Yeah, so I don't know, maybe first with you, Monica, is there anything new that, or any new strategies that you're looking to introduce or, or even things that you've tried to bring in that maybe haven't worked? It'd just be interesting to know, yeah, how, how it's evolving. Yeah, sure. I mean, maybe just one uh, one remark to uh, what Ben just said, and um, that people are afraid of speaking up. And I think that's also it's a psychological um, yeah reason for that because it's easier. People are afraid, more afraid of losing something than gaining something. And uh, what you do, you put yourself at risk, yeah, because you try something new and you can fail. So you are, are you could lose something, but you gain is something new, uh, something exciting. But uh, it's it's kind of a psychological principle that you are rather going for not risking to lose something than gaining something. So, and I think this is ex exactly what you need to overcome. And first is kind of being an example, a role model by yourself, trying it or senior level, and then also of course giving that space what we already discussed. Yeah, yeah I think maybe one thing I also want to mention here um, because we had here an emphasis on training. I'm completely convinced that training alone is not enough. Yeah, and that's also why we. Kind of implemented a whole program uh, called the Catalyst Fund, where we also then kind of nurtured that interesting ideas with a whole uh, also systematic approach, uh, uh, kind of close to the lean startup approach, where people could come up with uh, challenges and uh, and then also with ideas, first concepts, how to address them, um, and then of course we also together with the innovation committee and a local selected done these challenges and help them through the process uh, also with funding but even more important that they got coaching the teams got coaching on the lean startup methodology yeah and as you know many people love their solution so they see a problem and then they have an idea what's the solution but they stop there and just continue with that solution but uh, for us it was really critical that they first understand what's really the problem yeah and kind of asking the customer identifying clearly what is really behind that? Because sometimes what you think is the problem is not really the problem. So, and what needs to be fixed? And then what is the spectrum of solutions and not jumping immediately into something, yeah? And then having a clear process on prototyping and again, asking the customer on their willingness to pay, on their willingness uh, in, to, and to engage with that solution. Yeah? And a lot of focus we had uh, was also on turning um, kind of, coming up with new business models with all the digitalization you kind of change from providing products to providing services yeah i mean i can give one example i mean in the in, in our environmental business so we uh, sell pesticides also into plants and whatever to um, combat pests and before we only sold the product but now we are selling the service yeah, because it's it's way better for the company to book a whole service rather than just all of the products and then take care of yourself. So this is just one example of how to shift from a product to a service. So that was one emphasis on, on our program. Uh, and there are many more examples, but I, I just wanted to make that point. For me, it's not enough having the training because I, if you don't apply it, you will not really learn it um, and incorporate it in yourself. Thanks, Monica. Yeah, I, Cheng, I saw you nodding your head uh, when Monica was saying that. So. I don't know if you want to expand on that and how, how, how you feel that that's, that's worked within Quartzer as well. That would be interesting to hear. Yeah, to me, the biggest challenge was the speed of innovating uh, because tire industry is a, a mature industry and the safety concerns are quite high. Uh, and generally to get a product approved like in the medicine industry sometimes takes three to <laughs> 10 years uh, for approval. And to motivate people within the organization uh, that come up with an idea, I will <laughs> industrialize it after 10 years, <laughs> not motivating nobody. Uh, so in that respect, the agile lean startup methodology, minimum viable product type of things are helping us to increase the speed of innovation. This is extremely critical. That's why in today's life, innovation is driven by customers and markets rather than driven by R&D centers. So you have to have an outside-in perspective, not an inside-out perspective. Of course, there is science. Uh, there are innovations in science. But to bring that science, that technology into end products, 
you have to find the link between your customers, the challenges of your customers, and the technology challenges, and you have to make a feasible uh, business model or a feasible product. Yes, uh, I, if you allow me, I'd like to, uh, again, uh, follow up on this and rebound. I think that uh, uh, what, what Jenk is also saying is very important when you create the innovating engine is not only to provide the, the support and the training, but also to create a space where you narrow the distance between the would-be innovators and the customers. Uh, uh, on, on one side, so you, the, the innovating engine is actually about creating this space where you bring uh, the innovators within the organization who don't necessarily need to be the R&D people, but to be in very close contact to, to, to the customer. And I, and I still remember the example uh, from Quartza sending teams to, to their customers' plants, but I think Jen can talk about that uh, better than I do. But there's another space also that is very important is internally to bring your, 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 your would-be innovators closer to the marketing and salespeople. This is very important. That partnership between the people who are either the customers who are in direct contact with the customer is very important. And I've seen this uh, uh, the, the clear pattern in the book where I've seen many examples of companies kind of opening, I think Quartza does it too, opening their research centers to the customers to come and, and bring their own problems and, 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 and challenge the company with their, their problems. Uh, I, I remember, for instance, uh, uh, Fiskars, for instance, the, 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 the Finnish uh, tools maker who, who invites even non-customers uh, to their R&D uh, labs. For instance, for, for understanding better about cutting tools, they invite surgeons, for instance, to, to or, or chefs to come and, and, and try their products. So I think creating, in addition to giving permission, uh, the training, uh, uh, creating the time, it's also very important to create a physical space or even digital. I think we solve is a digital space that brings would-be innovators with, with customer needs. I think systematically creating that space. And I think there's another theme that is running in the, in the question is this, uh, what Monica called the safety, the psychological safety. I want to reinforce that the notion of creating a formal innovating engine is to say that when people are switching their mind or switching their activity to innovating, when they are in the innovating mode, they are fully protected. And then when they switch back to his executive engine, this is a different rule of engagement. This is a different set of, 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 of standards. So when they are innovating, they are innovating and they're fully protected. So uh, this is important to, to, to highlight. Thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, so looking at the questions and, and we've got another 10 minutes. So if you do have a question, please put it in the, uh, in the Q&A. We'd, we'd love to get all your questions and try and answer them. Uh, another theme that's coming up in, in the questions is, is obviously you're talking about inspiring and getting the, the, the frontline and the middle managers um, on board and, uh, and you know, in, invested in the innovation process. But had, obviously when you, when you brought these engines into to, to both your organizations, it was relatively early on. Did you get resistance from, from leadership? And uh, if you did, how did you, how did you address that? I mean, that would be really interesting to hear about. Um, and I don't know who wants to take, take that first. No, Monica, please. <laughs> yeah, no, no, happy to do so. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, um, we also uh, observed resistance because, uh, and and it's, it's especially also in the middle management because people are also overwhelmed. Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily that they don't want to do it. Yeah, but they are also overwhelmed in terms of because they a lot of of the execution uh, lasts on their shoulders. Yeah. So and this is was that's why it was so critical to involve them. Yeah, and to explain. So if you go, let's assume just to their employees, then all of a sudden they don't know what's going to happen with them, what are they doing, what crazy things they are doing. So that was really crucial for us to work with them and then also give them a role. And it, that was kind of the role of the innovation ambassadors, uh, at least some of them, of course, not everyone, who then helped to orchestrate uh, that whole innovation engine. But uh, yeah, even if they weren't in innovation ambassadors, we really made regular calls and also to update them what's going on. And, but what also helped is that they recognized that it's a development tool for their employees. So if their employees became innovation coach, 
that got a certificate, but also it could be part of their development dialogue. Okay, you get engaged there and, and people really liked it because it's broad in their horizon and people like to connect there. So it's, and they're curious to learn from, uh, across the company because we are such a big company. So, and where do you have the opportunity to get out of your a little silo and to connect with others? So this is also a huge driver. So they learned that this is a kind of a development opportunity for their employees that also helped to, to get engaged. Yeah. And of course, it's, it's also then if you anchor it in, in KPIs um, to contribute to that innovation um, uh, activity, that, that also helps. But uh, I mean, for me, it's not KPIs are not the only solution because if people are not convinced, then they will not deliver their best. So I think it's really making them part of it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, Cenk as well. I mean, I don't know if 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 resistance is the right word, but are, are there were there members of the board who were kind of questioning? You know, uh, obviously to set these in innovation systems up and the training and everything, it's not necessarily a cheap process, uh, and and it's difficult to to give a kind of you know we are going to produce X, Y, and Z. So again, how do you how do you um, counter those that resistance, or how do you? How do you address that resistance from the leadership, you know, from the, from the people higher up? You know, if when we were a commodity supplier, we were challenged uh, by our cost structure and innovating, putting an innovating into the uh, engine into the system, of course, creates an extra cost at the beginning. Uh, so that's why at the beginning, we had some resistance from operations, from sales, from finance over there. But we have tackled with that by creating value from the innovating engine to the different uh, parts of the organization. Yes, we have to go and identify customer needs. We have to find solutions. But if you go and find a solution to a operating problem, a process, or if you find a solution to an equipment so that an operator or an operation guy can function better, then you start creating value insights. And then once they see that value, then they become your supporters. So in the innovating thing, yes, project management of every single idea is very critical, but the portfolio management of the different ideas from customer perspective, application development perspective, new product development perspective, cost perspective, how you balance them together aligned with your strategy is extremely critical. And our success, uh, our success was really first coming up with cost innovations and then transferring this cost innovations to product and new business model innovation. So we early got cost innovations. With that, we got the support of salespeople. We got the support of operations people because they believed that with these tools, with these methodologies, with these resources, actually we can add value to the existing system also. Okay. Uh, if you. No. Nick, I'm, I'm sorry, I, if you allow me, I want to kind of uh, follow up on uh, uh, the, the argument that uh, Monica was talking about, uh, how difficult it is to motivate people to, to innovate and how KPIs can be, can be elusive in a sense. Uh, it, pe people very clearly understand when they are in the execution engine, very often uh, the, 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 the job is, is structured, you have, you have clear control system, you have KPIs. So there's a, a very strong consciousness that uh, when you are in your execution mode, you, your boss can, 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 can detect if you're doing your job correctly, if you're delivering or not. But when you are in the innovating engine, it is very difficult for the boss to know whether you have an idea or not. As a matter of fact, you could, you could, you could, what you see because people are afraid, they play, they, they prefer to play it safe. If they have an idea and they are afraid of being kind of ridiculed or, 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 or to be scolded or, or, or feel rejection, they just don't volunteer their idea. So it's very important when people are in the innovating space to feel safe and secure. And if you allow me, I just want to tell you about a story um, which I learned here in Japan, 
uh, which I, I, I kind of teach very, very, very regularly, is about how I saw a, a manager kind of change the culture of his team with simply one word. Um, uh, and that was the word, thank you. Uh, because he knew that when people came to see him with a new idea, they were fundamentally taking a big risk. They were making a, taking a big risk because, you know, there was no way he would know they had the idea. So uh, he knew that when people came and say, boss, I have an idea, they were fundamentally giving, making him a gift. And he understood that when you, you receive a gift, you say thank you. And from then on, every time somebody came to see him with an idea, even a ridiculous idea, sometimes he would just say first, thank you. And I think this is, I mean, it's, it's a subtle thing, but this is a, a, a cultural element where people feel that if the ideas are wanted, uh, that, 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 that they're welcomed. And, and this is really a, a culture that you need to instill when you are in the innovating engine. The other pattern also I see that I want to kind of resonate from, from Monica and Jenka that I found across all the organization that I studied, uh, 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 this, uh, creation of uh, a support structure for middle managers, because middle managers, even if you train them in innovation, they don't have the time, they don't have the resources to be able to uh, uh, follow uh, projects. So like Monica was talking about a thousand innovation coaches, Jenk was talking about the TPM. I saw at uh, BSF, I saw at uh, even Samsung, I saw at uh, different organizations, the creation of this fantastic support structure for middle managers where anybody who had an idea individually or as a team could call upon these coaches to come and help them with their project. And I think that is very important to jumpstart uh, the innovating engine. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious we've only got a couple of minutes left. So um, I just want to very, very quickly, uh, I don't know if you've got any last words. I mean, particularly uh, Jane, Monica, um, about how innovation has helped uh, other areas of the, of the organization. I'm thinking particularly maybe sustainability. If, uh, if, if, if you can sum that up very quickly, I think we can overrun a tiny bit, but that would be fantastic. Yeah, because I think obviously everyone wants to know how, you know, how to be more sustainable and, and how, can, how can innovation help that process? Yeah, I, I can um, say a few words on this. Uh, of course, I mean, innovation uh, sustainability has become a very big topic. Yeah, And for me now, innovation and sustainability go hand in hand because so I'm, I'm absolutely convinced only through innovation we can solve that challenges today. So and that's also why we now have also turned quite uh, some substantial amount of our activities towards kind of delivering innovation, which can help to solve the problems. Yeah. And this is also how we kind of now use the innovation engine. We also have now a lot of what we have learned, how to build new businesses and so on. We are also translating now in external innovation in terms that we help for example, um, so we are working also with, with startups that support smallholder farmers, which are essential for our uh, production of food going forward. Yeah. So, and we help them also to scale. There's a lot of knowledge that we gained also through our innovation process and involving people that have been trained and have been learned also um, in, in that whole process. So I think it's a continuous development and sustainability is absolutely key. Um, and for me, it's kind of that triangle between uh, digital sustainability and innovation, which all, you cannot dissect it, it's all connected, yeah. Thank you. Um, Cenk, um, yeah, sorry, we haven't got much time left, but it'd be great to hear from you as well, how, how you feel um, this has helped transform the organization beyond just the simple, you know, new products, new services. Yeah, as discussed last week in Glasgow, actually, we as organizations are putting uh, long-term targets for sustainability, 2030 targets, 2050 targets. And once we draw the roadmaps for zero carbon emissions, we see that there are big gaps. And those gaps can only be uh, closed by coming up with new technologies, new, new innovations. That's why right now we are uh, dedicating 75% of our R&D resources, innovating resources in our industries to sustainability. 
And as the global organization at the whole Sabancı Holding, we are dedicating almost 50% of our uh, innovating resources to sustainability because sustainability is changing the uh, success criteria. Uh, net income, EBITDA, will not be enough uh, uh, as a success criteria. The impact that we create on environment, on society, plus our financial impact will be the new success criteria. That's why we have to come up, we have to dedicate all our innovative resources uh, to sustainability right now. Okay, thank you. Um, I see we're, we're running over a little bit, so I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to wrap it up. Ben, is there anything else you'd like to add just before we, we finish? Or? I, I just want to thank again uh, Monica and, 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 and Jank for generously uh, joining us uh, and, and for all the support along the way. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Jeng. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. thank you, everyone, for joining today. It's much appreciated. Um, sorry we didn't get to all the questions. I think we could have gone on for another half an hour at least, but uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, obviously, check the website for more great webinars, and, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you.